Today's message is somewhat meta. It's a sermon on a sermon. In our passage, Jesus is interpreting scripture for those who have gathered. He's interpreting the scripture in light of God's continued revelation and in light of the lived experience of the people. In other words, Jesus is preaching. And I'm going to actually read today's passage one more time. And if you have a Bible with you, or even if you want to pull it up on your phone, I actually encourage you to do so because we're going to stick pretty close to the text today. And I want to read it again because I want to read a little bit before today's lectionary passage officially starts. So starting with John chapter 6, verse 22 this time. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat there. They also saw that Jesus had not got into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Remember that. That's important. Then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So as you can hear, in this text from the Gospel of John, Jesus is actually talking with the people about a passage from Exodus, which just so happens to be the passage that we focused on together last week. It's almost like I planned it that way. So my meta sermon, it picks up where we left off. Now, to provide us all with a quick recap, last week's scripture from Exodus told the story of the miracle of the manna. The Israelites are journeying in the desert after escaping enslavement in Egypt. They run out of food, they get hungry and they bring their complaint to Moses and to God. God responds to their complaint by being present to them and providing for them. God gives them the manna from heaven, bread that appears fresh like dew each morning and quail that come each evening so that the Israelites might have sustenance for their journey. That context is critical for understanding today's scripture. 
not only because Jesus is preaching on it, but also because this gathered crowd, they know the Exodus story very, very well. I also want to take a moment and situate this passage from John in the larger gospel narrative, because that also has some critical pieces we need for understanding this text. This crowd of followers, they've been pursuing Jesus for quite some time. They've basically been following him all around the Sea of Galilee. And they flocked to him because they heard about the miracles he was performing, his healing of a royal official's son, his healing of a paralytic on the Sabbath. This is also the crowd, or at least part of the crowd, that was there and fed by the loaves and the fishes. Also, this crowd has just gotten wind about Jesus walking on water. That's why I wanted to back up a little bit and read those first few verses. The people, they wake up in the morning. This is right after they've been fed by the loaves and fishes, and they see that Jesus is gone. But they also know that he didn't get into the boat with his disciples. So something doesn't quite add up, and they all pile into their own boats and set off in search of Jesus for some answers. Now, all of that sets up that first question in today's text. Jesus, when did you come here? This isn't just a general question. Hey, Jesus, when did you get into town? Are you having a good time? No, it's a rather specific question. Jesus, when did you go across the sea? And implicit in that question is, Jesus, how? exactly did you get across the sea? This question, it sets off a teaching that's all about the identity of Jesus. This is a major theme in the Gospel of John. John's Gospel is known for being very symbolic. Sometimes it even gets this reputation of being kind of confusing and paradoxical. It can be hard to read, but the author uses all of this complex language in order to get at this deeper understanding of who Jesus is and what Jesus has come to do. The author is trying to get at this larger mystery. So Jesus receives this question and he responds to the crowd in a very Jesus-y way. He doesn't really answer the question that they've asked. Instead, he prompts a reflection on their intention. Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Jesus perceives that while the crowd literally saw his actions, literally saw him take those loaves and fish and multiply them to feed thousands, that they don't really understand the deeper meaning. Jesus knows that this group is seeking him for the wrong reasons, or at least for reasons that don't align with his true purpose. Some of them want to make Jesus a king and a military ruler. Some are in it for the show. They are following, wondering what in the world this guy is going to do next. And some are probably willing to follow whoever and whatever promises them healing. We don't have to work that hard to imagine other reasons people might pursue Jesus, right? For there are as many reasons then as there are now. Some follow Jesus for a proximity to power, some out of habit, some with a desire to be seen as good. Now, not all of those reasons are necessarily bad, but none of those aligns with Jesus's true purpose. 
So Jesus offers the crowd a bit of a course correction here. He says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. Jesus is suggesting that one should not only be filled, but fulfilled. Our physical needs, they are important, but we can spend so much time focused on the food and the things that perish that we miss this greater fulfillment of our lives and of our souls. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. The crowd has another question. Jesus, what must we do to perform the works of God? They're saying, okay, Jesus, you tell us we should work for the food that endures, but what is this work exactly? This is an excellent question. This is a relevant question. Personally, I think it's a question that Christians and churches should regularly ask themselves. What is the work we should be doing as followers of Jesus? What is the work that we are called to do? The work is faith. Listen to what Jesus says. This is the work of God that you believe. You believe in him whom he sent. Now, remember from last week that faith is not only or even primarily a cognitive act. Faith is an embodied experience, an incarnational experience. Jesus is, after all, God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us. And the Gospel of John, it echoes this message again and again. The author of this Gospel only uses the active form of the word pistis, meaning faith. Another way of saying this, in the Gospel of John, faith is a verb, not a noun. Faith is something you do. Faith is something you practice. Faith is something you experience. It's not something that you own. Now, this might not sound significant. Maybe it sounds like I'm splitting hairs or being very particular about grammar, but it's actually a really big difference. It's the difference between believing in a concept and acting on it. I can believe in faith. I can believe in justice. I can believe theoretically in love without ever actually showing faith or doing justice or loving people. The work is to believe, not to achieve. Jesus is saying, yes, the miracles I'm doing, they're important, but they are but signs. They are not an end in themselves. They are outward manifestations of this incarnational love. The people that Jesus is speaking to do not yet understand that the goal is not to achieve many things. But rather, as one commentator put it, to let God do her unique work through a living faith in the son she sent. The work is not to achieve many things. Oof. How countercultural is that? An achievement mindset is pervasive in our society. It's how we measure education, career, celebrity, economy. How many, many degrees did she earn and from where? How many followers do they have? How much money does he make? And because it is so pervasive, it's often how we start to evaluate our lives as Christians or how we evaluate church. Now, I'll be the first to admit that I can be quite driven by the achievement mindset. And so I'm challenging myself as much as all of us 
as we think about our individual lives and as our life as a church that we notice when we start operating out of that achievement mindset. It's a question to ask ourselves when we think about where we spend our time and money, as we think about our goals, as we think about our priorities, because this text tells us that achievement, that's not the work. The work of Christian life is to believe in Jesus, to believe in the Christ who advocated, loved, and healed, to believe that resurrection and renewal are possible, and to go and do likewise. Jesus tells the people why they should follow. Jesus defines their work. And the people have one more question. What sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? There's some irony here, right? Remember that these are the people who have seen the healings and who have seen the loaves and the fishes. But the people say, what sign are you going to give us? And then they use the miracle of the manna in Exodus as an example. God gave the Israelites a sign. We need a sign too. I hope you can hear the similarities between the Israelites in Exodus and this crowd in the Gospel of John. In Exodus, we hear the story of a people who have been liberated they were liberated from enslavement in Egypt. They saw the signs of God, yet they still couldn't trust the presence of God in their midst. And here in the Gospel of John, we have a story of a people who have been miraculously fed, who have seen the signs of God, yet who cannot trust God's presence in their midst. Now, here's where Jesus really starts to preach. He really goes in and he brings up an issue of translation, shifting their past tense to the present tense. Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you true bread from heaven. Do you hear that? God didn't give the manna. God is giving the manna. Jesus is saying God is active right here, right now. Jesus then goes a little further saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the first of seven I am statements in the gospel of John, each one revealing something essential about who Jesus is and how Jesus works. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. Throughout this gospel, Jesus continues to teach and show the people who he is. I am the bread of life. Jesus is like manna. Manna that sustains us. Manna that is there every single day. Manna that leads us to experience an active incarnate faith. Jesus says to the people, my friends, Exodus wasn't just a story. It's not just a story we tell. The manna is right here, right now. And likewise, for us today, this passage from the Gospel of John, it isn't just a story. It's not just something that we read and leave on the page. Jesus is right here, right now. Jesus is the bread of life then. Jesus is the bread of life now. Jesus is the bread of life forevermore. Amen. Look around. Does anyone here notice that Jesus is right here, right now? I just saw Sister Bethany walk in after having a hip replacement surgery on Thursday. Jesus is right here, right now. Did you hear that incredible music? Jesus is right here, right now. We are together after this past year. 
Jesus is right here, right now, for each and every one of us. Daily bread. Open our eyes. Take and eat. Amen. Thank you.